Okay, thank you everyone for joining us on this beautiful 24th day in July to hear and share in a discussion that is penetrating all of our hearts. In the words of Martin Luther King Jr., injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We're caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. I'm Emily Smith, co-creator of Touchstone Central Coast. My partner, Diane Adam, and I are committed to bringing meaningful content to all of our followers and clients. We care about major issues that concern you, especially when you're treated unjustly. We don't have all the answers, but we are committed to not remaining silent. We are committed to an ongoing dialogue. We will continue to educate ourselves, seek out resources, and listen and learn. It is more important now more than ever to talk with one another and to listen and to find common ground and healing in our humanness. We are committed to learning, growing, and sharing what we learn. As John Lewis said, we may not have chosen the time, but the time has chosen us. So as we seek to deepen our understanding about social justice and racial inequality, race, racism, and race relations, I wanna introduce you to someone very special. Helping leaders demonstrate their commitment to inclusion is a priority for Tracy Brown. Her passion is helping individuals take responsibility for building effective cross-cultural relationships that can help them achieve their personal and professional goals. And her talent is transforming conversations about diversity from a debate about politics and personality into a dialogue about relationships and results. Tracy is president of Intentional Inclusion her message that diversity and inclusion can be a strategic advantage has been featured in HR Magazine, Texas Monthly, Fox Radio Network, and many, many other publications and broadcasts. Her books include 71 Ways to Inspire Commitment to Diversity, and her TEDx talk, What is Mine to Do, was followed up with an active Facebook group where more than 2,000 members focus on what committed individuals can do to help eliminate race-based hatred and violence. But anyone who knows Tracy, well, would also tell you if it's a Thursday or a Sunday night, you can almost always find her at the roller skating rink. So this afternoon, Tracy will share and talk with us about race. Please join me in welcoming Tracy Brown. This idea of let's start talking about race is kind of grounded in that place of it's a conversation that's not easy, but it's a conversation that we have to be willing to engage in. If we want to be a part of a solution to racism, if we want to create change in our neighborhoods, in our communities, in our schools, our workplaces, in our, the places where we worship or play, and so I have a goal in this <clears throat> very short time that we get to spend together. And that goal is to give you some basic information, to give you a little bit of inspiration, and third, to answer some questions that you might have that are pretty common questions. So you've already heard quite a bit about me. I am an author, I am a speaker, and I work with organizations and associations and leaders all over the United States. And the three labels that come up the most are my primary business, Intentional Inclusion Incorporated, uh, Mind to Do, which you heard about, which is a face, public Facebook group where every day we are digging into this question, what's mine to do to interrupt or end race-based hatred or violence? And the image on the lower left, stained glass spirit, represents the work that I do around all aspects of diversity and inclusion in spiritual communities. But today, I'm curious, why is it that you blocked an hour on your calendar, an hour out of your schedule? Why do you want to talk about race and racism? What is it about this subject 
that is makes this important to you right now? What is it about this subject that makes you want to invest in learning a little bit more or practicing a little bit more? So I'm going to invite you to use the Q&A or use the chat, actually, since the chat is open, and just put in what's your reason for wanting to talk about racism or learn more about it. And because we have a little bit of confusion with the names, please be sure if your name is not showing when you go to post to put it in parenthesis or to include it in your post. So I'd love to hear from at least 15 or 16 people in the chat. Why is it that you want to talk about or learn more about racism? And while you're doing that, I'm going to talk about some of the most common fears that people have related to talking about race and racism. And uh, um, there are a few of them, but first let me just start with what I mean by fears. <clears throat> so I don't mean that, oh my God, I'm terrified and I'm immobilized and I just can't even talk about it. I have a run away. No, although that could be true. When I'm using the word fear and what are some of the common fears related to talking about racism, I, you could also think of just what causes you discomfort or what is it that you hesitate about related to the topic of racism? What do you avoid talking about as it relates to racism? You might be all the way at immobilization or dismissing the topic completely because of some reason. But all I'm asking you to think about and to share, if you're brave enough to share, is what are you afraid about or what are the fears that you have? So when I'm saying fear, it might not be total immobilization, but it may just be discomfort. So it probably won't surprise you that the number one fear that people have about talking about anything related to race, race relations, or racism is they're afraid to offend, right? I'm afraid I'll offend someone. I'll say the wrong thing. And so my questions for you are, what do you think would happen if you offend someone? And why are you afraid of that? If you're afraid to offend, you can also be thinking about, oh, well, if I did offend someone, what could my response plan be? If you're afraid to offend someone and, and so you don't talk about race, think about when you have offended others in the past unintentionally, and what did you do then? Is that something you could do if you offended someone and the topic was race or racism or race relations. So often the things that we're afraid of or that we shy away from, we actually already have coping mechanisms or actual skills that allow us to navigate what we're afraid of. But there's something about talking about racism where people just lock up, you know, you've probably heard of um, fight or flight. Well, the other F in that equation is freeze. And when we hear the word racism, many of us just freeze. So we do know how. So the number one fear that comes up is being afraid to offend. Related to that is being afraid to use the wrong term. And, uh, you know, there are a lot of things that, a lot of ways that we could offend someone, but there's this specific focus on the language we use. Like, I cannot tell you how many times I get asked, well, Tracy, just tell me, is it black? Is it African-American? Is it colored? Is it people of color? Is it Afro-American? I mean, like, what is it? I want to use the right term now. None of you have ever asked anybody that question. But it is really common. 
And it's true whether we're talking about Black and African American or we're talking about, is it Hispanic or Latinx or is it Latino or is it Chicano or is it, is it, is it, is it, well, five things to keep in mind related to that fear. Topics and terminology change. In my own lifetime, the terminology for my race and ethnicity has changed at least five or six times from Negro to colored or from colored to Negro both. I heard them both when I was very young uh, to Afro-American, to Black, to African-American, to being a part of the umbrella group, people of color, to being a part of the umbrella group called global majority. And so topics and terminology change. Don't think you're going to learn one term and it's going to be the term you use forever or even for a year. Be ready to change. And what that requires is a recognition that it, there are regional variances. Uh, many of you uh, are familiar, many of you are familiar with uh, Kaiser Permanente. And I spent nine years of my career uh, working for Kaiser Permanente. And uh, um, I worked here in Texas in what was at that time the Southwest region. And uh, it was very interesting because as we were building the beginning stages of a diversity and inclusion strategy, we were using Hispanic and Mexican American because of the population that was here in Texas and in the Southwest. And those two terms were the preferred terms. And I had many conversations with my colleagues who were in different parts of California, who were insisting that the term we needed to use throughout the nation was Chicano or Chicana, because they were being told by their local and regional constituents that that was the preferred term. And so when we realized we were talking about a regional preference, and that we all needed to become skilled and comfortable with the regional differences, then we could stop arguing about which term was right and recognize that in different settings, different terms would be the preferred terminology. And that led to the next tip related to this, which is ask. So it's not a bad thing to ask. People don't always expect you to know. And uh, if you ask from the place of engaging, the ask from the place of what is it that you prefer or what is it that this group prefers because I want to honor and respect what you prefer, then that's received well. It's not received well when the question is, there are so many darn groups. I don't know. Tell me what you want me to say, right? There's a whole different energy there. And so it is good to ask and to ask from a place of true inquiry and curiosity in terms of relationship building, not in terms of judging. And then finally, stop expecting yourself to get it right every time. That's what makes the fear be do I grow? Like, I'm afraid if I get it wrong, what will happen? You're going to get it wrong sometimes. <clears throat> I do this work for a living. I get labels, categories wrong sometimes. Not just related to race. In all aspects of diversity and inclusion, the terms, the topics, the terminology changes. That's the skill you want to develop, the skill in asking, the skill in recovering, not, the, not creating the expectation that you'll get it right every time. What's the number three fear that people have? The number three fear that people are afraid they'll lose relationships. 
affiliation with people they know or like or people they need in order to do their jobs. So on the one level, as we talk about race, um, one of the questions I ask often is, do you really want to be associated with people who are intentionally racist? So are you really afraid to lose that relationship with your second cousin or the person you work with for 10 years, but you only see them you know, once every three months or every six months? Or you only are connected to them on social media? Like really, uh, some people you really might want to choose to remove either remove from your life or limit your exposure to them over time. You can set boundaries. It's not all or nothing. You can set certain boundaries in frequency and you can set boundaries in terms of what language is used or how it's used or when it's used. One of my favorite stories right now is about a uh, a colleague who shared with me about a month ago, like a little bit more, was around the Memorial Day holiday, so earlier this year. And uh, um, we were talking about what we had done over this holiday weekend in light of social, physical distancing, the pandemic. And as it had turned out, um, a member of her family owns a pretty big piece of property. And so there had been about a dozen to 15 family members who came together over that weekend. And it worked because one, their family, but also, you know, they were still able to be outside more than inside. And there were, you know, a number of different factors that made it relatively safe. And, um, and they masked or she masked a large part of the time when they were in closer quarters. So she shared with, about a year and a half ago, she had shared with me that she had had a big conversation with her parents and her brother and, and then several succeeding conversations with other family members that she really um, asked them not to use the N word in her presence. And, um, it was really stressful for her to have that conversation and set that boundary. And she got a, little, a lot of grief about it. Um, and the comments that were made to her initially were not supportive. And she really worried about had she done the wrong thing. And we talked about it back then. And uh, she had not done it in an angry way. So I encouraged her to know that you have the right to establish boundaries with people, even your family, and you're just practicing. You know, you, you're not giving them an ultimatum. You're not telling them you're gonna, you know, report them to the police or who's the police on the N word anyway. Um, but she made the request and she had to make the request again the next time and the next time. And then she noticed that her parents changed some of their conversation around them. So this has been going on for a, almost a year and a half and Memorial Day weekend, what she shared with me was from having set those boundaries and just gently reinforcing them whenever somebody would ignore it, that Memorial Day weekend, no one who was in her close by presence used the N-word or, or told any jokes that had racial slurs or had a negative racial, racial implication. And how different that was from two years ago, five years ago, and most of her life. And then the funny part was she said, but Tracy, what I recognize is they are not necessarily changing their language or behavior when I'm not around, because at one point, they were in the house and she was in run, one room and five or six people were like a room and a half away and they were joking with each other and laughing. And she heard language that they would not use in her presence. She was confident if she walked into the room, 
they would change the topic, they would change the conversation. But it made her realize that you do have the power to influence without losing the relationships completely. And so afraid to lose relationships with coworkers or family, and family's the hardest, I, I, you know, obviously, which is one reason I share her story with her permission. And uh, then coworkers are the second hardest because you don't get to choose who you work with. And so there are all kinds of people in our workplaces that we must navigate our working life with. So you're not the expert of all related topics to, or to all topics related to racism. So you've got to become comfortable asking questions. And to encourage you to do that, I just give you a learner's permit. What do I mean by that? I'll tell you in a minute. But I give you a learner's permit. And then you want to give up the need to be right versus the desire to be constantly learning. I cannot give you a recipe, but it, it's always about building relationships. What kind of relationships do you want to believe, want to live with, and what are the methods that you can use to demonstrate respect of all people? So it's not a recipe, but it's about relationships and it's about respect. So let me tell you a little bit more about learner's permit, and then I'm gonna go over to the chat and see what your reasons for being here are and talk a little bit about that. So this whole idea of learning, you came today because you wanted to learn something. Think about when you first started to drive. For most of us, we were 15 to 16 years old. Maybe we had had some practice younger on back roads or out on our uh, family's farm or you know, out in a rural area. But to be legally driving, you know, most of us around 15 or 16 years old, we go through the process of taking a test, getting a learner's permit, and then practicing before we actually get our driver's license. Think about it. If, if you were 15 or 16 or definitely older, you've been riding in cars for most of that time. You have been observing lots of different people drive. You, you, knew, you knew how to do this. And you had even ridden with people who you thought were bad drivers. And they didn't drive so well. And so you knew, you, I'm not going to be like them. But still, you had to get the book from the state, and you had to study the laws and get some framework and uh, pass that test. And then you got a learner's permit. And when you first got in the car, once you had your learner's permit, you were probably a little overconfident, even though you might have been also a little scared, like both of those things happening at the same time. And you're thinking, how hard can it be? Steering wheel, accelerator, brake, and then you pull out and you start driving, even if it was just in the parking lot of a big shopping center. And you realize, wait a minute, I'm looking through the windshield, but I'm supposed to look in the rearview mirror, and oh, I've got to check these side mirrors because there could be something on the side that I can't see. And maybe I also better look around really quickly in case there's a vehicle in my blind spot because I don't want to hit it. And then wait, I'm, I, I, did any of you like me? like every other time you try to ease onto the brake, but for some reason you and the car would go like this because you hit the brake too hard because you hadn't got the balance yet and the accelerator, and we won't even talk about if you were driving or learning on a manual transmission and you had to <laughs> deal with the clutch as well. We're not even gonna go there. And so all of a sudden when you get ready to do it, it's just not as easy as it looks. And so what I want to do for you 
as you engage more in this conversation about race and racism and race relations, I want to gift you with a learner's permit, that you have a permit to take it a little slow, slow down a little bit. Pretend that you're driving the car that has the magnet on the back that says student driver, <laughs> right? And you have a permission to ask questions. Ask questions that give you more information and allow you to stand more firmly um, in, in the conversation. And you have permission to practice. Yesterday, I went to the barber shop, and when I was coming back home, I, I, don't, I don't really remember, right? I got home, and I can't tell you which route I took. I can't tell you whether traffic was heavy or not. I was so much on automatic that I don't remember I, because I didn't have to concentrate as I drove. As you talk about race and racism, you have to concentrate. Even me, who, has, who is a subject matter expert, there are times when I have to slow down, give myself a permit, ask questions, and pay attention to what's going on. So I love some of these reasons why you wanted to talk about racism today. And uh, I love this, did you realize how that sounds? Were you aware? I'm surprised at how often people don't recognize what they are saying or the implication of what they are saying because we, and I know I'm adding to what you've typed here, but because we do have ingrained social responses the cycle of socialization, which is a, you know, applied behavioral science model, the cycle of socialization is always working. And the things that we grew up hearing or the things that we hear over and over and over again, we just take in and we either assume they're correct or we don't even, we're not even aware of how it impacts us. So uh, let me scroll up a little and see what you wrote. Um, thank you. I wanted to be here because I hate racism. Uh, racism is so built into all aspects of our society that, well, I'll say it the way that I talk about it in the What Is Mine To Do group. We can't just talk about ending racism. We have to talk about what we want our company, our community, our society to look like and how we want life to be so that racism can't exist. Like so often we say, we don't want there to be racism anymore. And then I'll ask people, so what would a typical week look like if there were no racism? Or what kinds of conversations would we have if we weren't talking about ending racism? So our emotion needs to be strong. Our passion needs to be strong that we want to interrupt and end racism, but we have to have a very clear vision about what will replace the racism that we are eliminating. And that is where we want our passion. So we've got to, just like if we were grieving, we want to feel the grief and feel it fully. And what then pulls us from the depths of grief to the memories that remind us of love is because we begin to think about how our life will be without that person or without that job, or without that resource. And so this is the same way we, when we think that we um, just want to get rid of racism, or we want to 
well, I, two things, that we just want to get rid of racism, then begin to ask yourself, what would my city look like if there were no racism? And begin to talk about that. So often I will say, um, instead of what is mine to do to interrupt or end racism, about 50% of the time I will say, what is mine to do to create a community where there is mutual respect? Or what is mine to do to contribute to a workplace or a place of worship where everyone has equal opportunities regardless of race or ethnicity. Because I want to think about how that's going to translate into housing, into um, employment, into the neighborhood, the makeup, the demographics in my neighborhood, into the community service or outreach projects that I get involved in. And so I be, want to begin to replace the scourge, the, the illness, the discomfort, the inappropriateness of racism with the joy and the things that represent harmony and unity and respect. So I, I hope that makes sense. So let's see what else is here. You joined today because I want to be better informed so I can be a change agent in my personal and professional life to promote equity. Yes, yes. And I'm not sure if it's Petra or Petra because I have friends who one uses Petra and one uses Petra. Um, but I love that comment because so much does require us each to be really well informed so that we are not just going from our personal opinion, but that we are uh, educated and we are constantly educating ourselves. Let's see, I think I can have time to pick up one or two more. My company provides disability equity and inclusion training to connect communities through critical conversations. I want to, oops, I lost it. Scrolling is tricky today. I want to better understand the intersectionality of disability and race. Oh, bless bless, bless you. So one of the challenges that comes up that I didn't mention, but it's often number five or six on the list of, of fears or discomforts or, or concerns about talking about race. And that is this, this um, opportunity for intersectionality. What often happens is that people will have a, a high degree of comfort talking about misogyny or um, gender inequity and or they may have a com have some comfort talking about uh, sexism or uh, homophobia or they, they they may have some comfort with some other topic even sustainability or how we need to eliminate homelessness and make sure that we reduce the number of people who are unsheltered. So there's this hesitance to talk about race because it's like, well, no, this is the issue and we don't wanna talk about race and take attention away from this that I'm focused on. But the reality in every, is that in every form of disparity, race is a factor. We've seen that with the pandemic. We have seen it magnified that we have historically not done well in reducing disparity that is based on race in terms of chronic disease, in terms of access to health care, in terms of the delivery of care, looking at the percentage of people in the population who are black and brown versus the percentage of the people who are 
either have more serious cases of COVID-19 or are forming a larger percentage of the people who actually die. Um, where the testing centers originally were placed. All of these things were just holding a mirror up to how we have closed our eyes in the past to think to these patterns that reflect racism in our society, in our nation, in our large cities especially. And so it pops up. We want to just talk about COVID-19 and how we manage our response to it. But we can't talk about that without race. We can't talk about the feminist movement without talking about how Black women were not included or how they were purposely excluded so that the attention would be singularly focused. We cannot talk about um, so, uh, sustainability, I won't even go to economic, but sustainability and recycling and all of those conversations, there are reasons why. There are reasons why, because we weren't willing to deal with the impact of race, that we have different outcomes in different communities, different interests, and we have large communities where they can't look at sustainability because they can barely deal with, and what's in their radar is survival, right? So looking at recycling or composting or growing your own food or having all of these things, you know, adding solar panels, all of the things that, are, that we know make a difference. But if you live, if you have large populations that can't even survive, that don't have enough money to ensure they have a safe place to live, a healthy place to live, live in a food desert because um, grocery stores or healthy food vendors don't cater to their area. All of that is racism in action. So the intersectionality is there with all aspects that we look at. And I love that from a perspective of disability and people with differing abilities, that we also have to look at how are the resources distributed? Who's educated and who's not? Who's trained with special skills and how are they trained? And is the training accessible to, to lots of people who represent different racial and ethnic groups? And as I'm saying this, please understand, I am not just talking about black and white. I'm talking about all the many different mixes and, and variations of racial and ethnic groups in our multi-ethnic, multicultural, multi-generational society of the 21st century. And so it's complicated. Probably the most difficult thing of all of, of setting a you know one hour time slot is that this is so complex. So my job really is to just give you some information and to encourage you to keep with it, to use your learner's permit, to ask information about um, race and how it impacts your part of the world, because that's where you get to make the most powerful contribution. None of us can impact every aspect of racism. And most of us are not elected leaders. And so we are not the ones passing the laws. We're not the ones setting the guidelines. We're not the ones who are creating the policies. But every person we meet, every relationship we build, every group that we interact with, we can be the voice in that group. We can be the person who establishes some boundaries in our own families, whether they are our biological families or our families of choice. And I'm going to see if I can get in one more before I shift. Sometimes the response is anger. And I don't understand why the color of our skin should have anything to do with who we connect with. 
we should just all be human and respect each other. Oh, Diane, thank you. Oh, oh you're probably not Diane. <laughs> you're probably just using the Diane name. Um, Crispy Compton, thank you. Thank you for adding your name in there. <laughs> so Crispy should, right, is, is, a, is a word we all use, but it doesn't give us much power. And so it, it would be a different world if the color of our skin was not a driving factor. But in 2020, it still is a driving factor way more often than it should be, should, right? Then we would like it to be. But I do want to challenge the end of your coming just a little bit. All being human and all respecting each other, I agree with 100%. However, what I want us to be cautious, all of us to be cautious about, is an idea that we're all human and we're all the same, because that's not actually not true. Right, so we've been created in many different colors and shades, and we've been created to live effectively in many different climates and in many different places. And so, yes, we're all human, and I want us to be curious about and relish in that, in, in that diversity of humanity. Biologically, we are 99 plus percent biologically the same as, as a species called human being or humankind, but that the places where we are different physically and culturally are valuable. And so I want us to create that type of environment where we learn about the differences, we value the differences, we celebrate the differences, and we actually utilize the differences that help us move toward a commonly shared goal more effectively, more quickly, uh, with more long-lasting effects. And so I, didn't, I don't think, I didn't take from what you wrote that you were implying that we're all the same. It just gave me an opportunity to remind us all that even though we are all human, it is the diversity that we bring that makes the big difference. So I am um, wanting in our last few minutes together to give you a couple of uh, tips, a couple more tips. So when I was sharing the, um, when I was sharing the most common questions, I also gave you some ways to think about that and some tips about that. But I want to also give you a few more suggestions for success. So I'm gonna go through these really, really fast. And then if you have a burning question, then I'm going to ask two or three people to put their burning question in the Q&A because it'll be easier for me to see than to try to monitor the chat. Or um, Emily or Diane, if you want to uh, pull out one or two questions that are in the chat, then I will respond to those specifically. So six, well, that's a blank slide. That's not what I want. That would not be the right slide. Let's try this again. <laughs> Let's go to, or maybe we won't. Maybe we will just go to your questions. So yeah, let's go to your question since we're down to the 10 minute mark anyway. And uh, if I can pull up these six 
Um, I think I accidentally deleted that. So if I can pull them up, I will do that. So um, a question to the Q&A, please. A question you'd like input on or a comment about or a reaction to. A raised hand or a question in the Q&A. I see a question popping up. We know that the Q&A works. Someone asked about book recommendations. So <laughs> I could spend two hours on books you want to read. Um, but what I often say is what's really, really important is that you read books. Well, there are two things. You want to read books that give you history. And so there are some great books that give you a multicultural history of the United States. And you, so reading that will fill in some of the blanks and tell you all kinds of things that you didn't know about before. And then you want to read the kind of books that you normally read, but you want to look for books that tell the story from a different perspective. So for example, if you love mysteries, then you want to find books that are written by authors who are from a different racial or ethnic group than you are. And then they or they the story is written around a different culture than you are. If you, you know, read um, science fiction and you haven't read Octavia Butler, then, you know, it's like get a different perspective that includes racial elements. And then the third thing, wherever your passion is. So with the question related to disabilities and intersectionality, um, it's really important to look for authors who are bringing a different perspective. And that's better than, in general, any one book. Uh, but it is good to have some history. Um, uh, <laughs> Kindred by Octavia Butler is great. Um, also, the book that I've been recommending by Octavia Butler a lot in the last couple of years has been Parable of the Soul, because it is so, it parallels, it's science fiction, but it parallels so much of what's going on in our society today. Uh, Judy Frost, thank you. Perhaps tools to help us respond to offensive remarks. Okay, I'm gonna look at the clock. I'm gonna go for one minute, maybe maximum two, um, with some very common responses when people make offensive remarks or tell a joke. The number one perfect response is a slight cock of the head and a I don't get it. Or, I'm sorry, what did you mean by that? Or what does that mean? The reason those, that's that, one of those three is the perfect number one response is two. One, there are two reasons. One is because um, you actually put the responsibility on the person who made the remark to clean it up. Or two, they really didn't intend to be offensive and you will know that by their response and then you know you probably have an opportunity to educate. Now I'm not talking about the person who says, oh you know what I meant and I, you know, um, no I'm not sure I did. Or okay so other possible, I'm going a different direction. So easy, easy response, wow. Wow, I, I never expected you to say something like that. Another easy response. Question. Do you realize that that what you just said or what you just did, it could be considered offensive by a large group of people? Um, and again, the key is being able to ask it in a relatively neutral tone. The mistake that most of us make is that we, we decide that we're going to be a diversity cop instead of a diversity coach. And so when someone says something that's uh, over the line or offensive, even if it's just questionable, we put on our armor and we put on our bulletproof vest and we go, 
that was the most racist thing you've ever said. See, there you go again. You're always saying these racist things. You know, I just hate it when you say, right, and our energetic and our tone and our language and everything about how we react is automatically going to make them defensive. And then that's going to close off the opportunity. And now, there is a time and place, ah, 30 seconds, there is a time and place to be able to actually correct someone and actually tell them that is unacceptable. And so if you are in a leadership role in an organization and someone is, you know, and you have a policy, um, you might educate the first time depending on how egregious it was, but typically the second or third time you get to stand in that place of responsibility as a manager, or as a leader and say, I need to remind you that in this organization, we have a policy that we will treat people respectfully. And what you just said was a racial slur. And if you continue to do those, say those kinds of things, you are putting your job in jeopardy. Fact, information, consequences. But 90% of the time, we don't have to stand in that place. 90% of the time, we are actually either educating or providing information that will help people behave differently the next time. I am very aware that our time is short. And that makes me a little sad because we've just begun to brush the surface. But let me summarize by saying the most powerful thing you can do is to be brave and to be courageous. That is how you represent or demonstrate your commitment. We are living in a time when because of the internet, we have more information available to us than at any previous time in the history of humanity. Everything you find on Google is not 100% correct, but it is a place to start. And we are living in 2020 in a time where because of the pandemic and because of a series of very visible and publicized events that reflect the racism that is a part of our society. We are living in a time where there are many people you can have this conversation with. And I encourage you to have the conversation, to use this time not as fixing an issue, but as an opportunity to learn and grow and lay a foundation for the kind of world that we really want to live in. And finally, I encourage you to do that, not because Tracy says so, and not because if you are someone who identifies as white, not because you wanna make the world better for those black people or those brown people or people who've had it hard for so long. Every one of us has it hard in some way or another. You may have it hard for different reasons, not because of the color of your skin. But I want you to take the action, not because you want to make it better for somebody else, but because you realize your world, it's your world too. And you want to be proud of the world that you live in and that you want to be able to answer the question, this, what is mine to do? This is what is mine to do to create a world where there is no race-based hatred or violence, to create a world where there is mutual respect, where people um, engage with one another without allowing race to be the issue. Race in itself is not a problem. It's the stories we tell and the systems that we have created around a hierarchy of race that are the problem. And I hope you'll join me in breaking down that hierarchy. My name is Tracy Brown and Emily, I'm gonna turn it back over to you in case you have announcements or anything like that.
I think Diane's going to take, take us out, but thank you, Tracy, so, so much. Yeah, for sure. Um, I can't see that my camera's coming on, so I'll just start talking. Tracy we Brown. You. <laughs> we can. Oh, good. Yeah. Tracy, thank you so much. That uh, hour that you spent with us just now is the epitome of what we try to teach and leading with love is part of the mission of Touchstone. We'd like to ask you just for maybe 10 seconds, maybe 15, tell us a little vision of what you're or what you feel leading with love means to you. Mm. Leading with love, that is so easy because I understand love is not just the romantic kind of love. And that love is really the givingness of the best of us into the universe. And so when I lead, whether I am officially in a title of leader or whether I am simply leading by example in the grocery store, leading with love actually for me means showing up with an open heart and dealing with each person in front of me knowing they are already whole and perfect and complete. Well, boy, I really appreciate the learner's permit, and I, I would include patience in that. That's something that I personally am practicing, and everything that you said today is hit everybody just perfectly, and, I, and we both appreciate that, Emily and I. Uh, we want to say thank you and to remind our audience uh, that we have Touchstone topics twice a month, and we're doing them virtually now uh, in this pandemic, and it's been really a great honor for us. Um, we encourage all of you to like uh, and share with people and invite them to follow us on social media. I've put the content, uh, the contact info in the chat from the bottom of our hearts, everybody on the audience I know, but especially Emily and I, Touchstone, thank you so very much, Tracy, for being our friend and our partner. And we are ready to make the change and take the challenge. And I'm putting my learner's permit in my wallet right now. Yeah.